okay because I've always been the one with the quote unquote crazy idea trying to get buy in from others. Well, in many ways, you're spot on. The, in so many ways, the California Symphony was a testing ground for me. And I think, you know, I'll caveat that by saying some people think, wow, where did this woman come from, How, you know, these last five years? And the reality is, no, I've had 15 years in this industry now. And so a lot of the things that I put together at the California Symphony, I had been uh, trying it, as much as my previous roles would allow for what you know the scope at those organizations would allow for it with success so when I came to the California Symphony I remember vividly in my interviews telling the board you say you want change do you mean it you know and they said yes you know we know we need it and I always say now that you know the silver lining of an orchestra in crisis is that they are a little more open to change and we can leverage that to do things differently. So all that combined, fast forward to 2016, I took the job in 2014, so two years later, we had already begun seeing some really significant results. And I thought to myself, Aubrey, you need to share this with the world. You need to, as a service to the field, as a way to raise my own visibility in the work that we're doing here, so it just seemed to check a lot of boxes. Good for my organization to share what we're doing. Good for me personally. Good for the industry. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to start writing about it. And I've tried since then. It's been three years now of blogging. I try to write about once a month. I don't always make that cadence, but I try to really write, as you've seen, these meaty posts that... Um, get into the details of how we've done it and in some cases how that can scale up to bigger organizations because I care about that a lot and that's where I cut my teeth in this industry is at the much bigger institutions. So anyways, all of this is to say uh, those are all the reasons I started writing about it. I think I think it, it matters and I will say I mean, conversations like this have happened because of that. You know, it's really, the bonus is that it has completely extended my network and I've just been able to to hear from so many other orchestras and performing arts organizations and writers like you. And it's just been a real pleasure to see that unanticipated outcome. Wow. <laughs> That, oh my gosh, this compliment means so much coming from a writer, so thank you. I, I've always enjoyed writing. I mean, since I can remember times in elementary school where, um, you know, writing was a big part of our assignments. Even then, I had teachers that really cared about that, and that was always something that I did well in, and uh, I've just always enjoyed it. And I was, I mean, I was a good student, <laughs> and... Um, even I even remember at Rice, like even, you know, getting a music degree, you know, there's so many instrumentalists there and not everybody is a strong writer, of course. And um, I just remember even, you know, my papers in school getting, you know, really good grades on them. So I just, uh, I don't know, I've just always liked writing. It's a way that, it's a way that I think, I mean, you get this as in terms of expression, you get to edit yourself and you don't get to do that. <laughs> <laughs> live on camera or extemporaneous speaking you know it's a really different skill set to go back and be able to edit to make sure you get your idea across in the way you want and I just um, I, I enjoy it so thank you Yes, you are absolutely right. Uh, so um, for me, I knew in high school that I wanted to manage a major symphony orchestra, which is so rare that, you know, so many people in these jobs, they either fall into the administrative side or uh, it just becomes a viable career option and we become aware of that much later in life. But for me, my path was that since I was a sophomore in high school, this is what I wanted to do. And so when I was... Uh, a junior and senior in high school and looking at options for college, for me, it was so clear that I needed a performance degree and I needed a business degree. 
And in my mind, that's what I needed to do to be able to manage a symphony orchestra. And that was really before sort of these masters in arts administration programs became, I won't even say popular, because I wouldn't say they're popular today, but really before they emerged the way they exist now. So, um, so for undergrad, that meant, and I was, a, and I was a good musician to a degree. I mean, good enough to get into a school like Rice. And so, um, so for me, it was so important that I wasn't going to pursue conservatory only. That wasn't going to fit the bill. And some of the big state schools, you could major in music as well as major in business. But I knew that the this is not universally true, but by and large, I knew that the quality of the music program wouldn't be as high compared to a conservatory type school. And so it just so quickly, as I was looking at my college options and applying slash auditioning, I just knew Rice was my by far my first choice. It happened to be in my hometown. I was not eager to stay in Houston because that's where I grew up. I wanted to spread my wings, but it just, I wanted to go to that school. And I had begun studying with David Kirk who became my teacher there. Um, I actually first met him when I was in sixth grade studying with one of his students. So I knew him, um, had so much respect for him, so much respect for the Shepherd School of Music. And Rice was a place where you could have two degrees. And I thought, that's, I mean, that checks every box. It's such a good school, you know, every box except being a little close to home, but that's okay. Yeah, yes. So I will say mom and dad were super cool. They let me move on campus and it, it, it didn't feel like I was close to home. They really gave me the space I needed. So I just, I had an amazing time at Rice living on campus. I was super involved in um, the dorms there are called colleges. So I was super involved in my residential college and it just was this, I mean, for me, my time there was just this magical time where I was able to pursue all of these interests that I had and the rice environment facilitates that. And I think you are right though, that so many times um, your academic path that you choose is very siloed. And I think even at a school like Rice, you know, at the Shepherd School, you are trained to be a serious musician, in many cases training to be an instrumentalist in a major symphony orchestra. And Rice is very good at that. And I, on one hand, I love that training and I am so grateful for that training because anytime I am, I meet a musician and I say I have a performance degree from Rice, I'm gained instant credibility and access to that person just because I have that credential and that means the world to me in this industry. So I'm so grateful for that. Um, I think there were times where it was really challenging. I, you know, I remember uh, my teacher, David Kirk, saying to me, Aubrey, if you come here, it's going to be like you're getting a degree from Juilliard and a degree from Harvard. And, <laughs> and I don't know if you want to print that in their magazine, but, <laughs> um, but I just remember thinking, yes, that's exactly what I want. You know, it just that, to me, that just felt like such a, a well-rounded person to, to help me achieve what I wanted to achieve. Yes and no. I think, so I remember thinking a few different things. One, I really did love playing my instrument. I mean, there's no way I think I could have made it four years at a really intensive program like the Shepherd School of Music if I didn't enjoy it. I mean, you know, it's hours in the practice room every day on top of your hours of rehearsals for orchestra, for ensemble lessons, all of that. So if I didn't enjoy it, I couldn't, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't have made it, I don't think. But I, so I felt a couple things. I felt, I, I mean, I did feel in, like I enjoyed it. I, like if, if I knew it would be easy to win a job playing my instrument in an in a orchestra, yeah, maybe I would have chosen that path and pursued that path. But I also, I think it becomes so clear at a wonderful school like the Shepherd School, a wonderful program that... That it, that it is so difficult to win those jobs that, you know, and especially in orchestras in America, there's one tuba player in the orchestra. That's it. So that's, you know, if you're talking a full-time job playing the tuba, that's what, like 15 or 18 of those jobs in the country, period. 
And so, which ironically I now realize is also true of executive director CEO. <laughs> There's also only one of those. So in hindsight, I'm like, okay, maybe I didn't really open up options for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that line of thought, having experience in the shoes of being a musician, that's why it was important to me to pursue the performance degree. I, I can say I know firsthand how many hours it takes, how much every single one of those people who've won jobs have practiced, how, how much um, money it takes to fly around the country to take these auditions and then maybe not even advance past the first round, the toll that takes, uh, not just financially, but emotionally. I think I'm really grateful that I have that experience and that I know that, uh, I, you know, it, there's so much nuance to being a performing musician you know you can have you can be an excellent player and that's just not quite what the committee wanted to hear that day you could miss one note and then you're out on the first round or you know whatever it's just so it's just really crazy when you think about what it takes to win one of these jobs and I never would have that perspective if I didn't have this degree from this program with that kind of rigor Yes, you are right about that, Ken. So this is how this is how this came about this this career transition. So it, everything you just described is correct. Over the last, so as you said, I started blogging in 2016, and then with that came some visibility, and then other organizations started reaching out for speaking engagements, for questions, for advice, and I realized how much I enjoyed those conversations. And it really just, it lifted me out of the weeds of the day-to-day -day of my current job because at an organization the size of the California Symphony, the executive director role can be pretty operational and in the weeds. It's just, this, you know, the small size of the staff requires that. And so I realized these conversations were, you know, would just lift me up and fill me up and energize me and we're talking about big issues that affect all of us in the performing arts industry and I just loved it. So then about a year and a half, two years ago, I started charging and nobody blinked an eye. Everybody said, yeah, okay. And then I thought, wow, maybe there's something here. So. Over, since December, so the last six months or so, I've started this plan of, okay, what would this look like? How can I have an impact beyond my one organization? How can I, I mean, I, you know, I write about changing the narrative for the industry. How do I get real serious about actually doing that, Aubrey? You know, and so I thought, I think there might be something here. I think there might be a way to, to sh share my experience, share these data driven data-driven practices, show that what we've accomplished has been vetted, tested, authenticated, um, and that I do have the chops from bigger organizations as well. And I thought, okay, I'm going to take this leap because also I think it's worth mentioning this is not necessarily the prescribed path for arts management. And I think, you know, so often in this industry, what the industry says is, well, you got to go be CEO at a slightly larger organization. And that to me felt less palatable. It felt like I was just, I mean, I was getting offers for those types of jobs and it just felt like it's the same thing I just did. Just add a zero to the budget. And that's not where the challenge lies. You know, the financial document of the budget is not where the challenge lies. And so all of that combined, I thought, I think I'm going to try to rewrite the rules a little bit about what my path can be. And the more I started thinking about what I said about, you know, impacting multiple organizations of all sizes, of all geographic locations, I got so excited. And then realizing that, yeah, people are willing to pay for that. I thought, I think this is, this is the next step for me. And it took, it took me, I think a good year of really thinking through that and, and, making a plan and now here we are and the response since the announcement has been amazing. 
so many orchestras, uh, not just orchestras, orchestras, opera companies, dance companies, theaters have reached out um, from all corners of the country, including Canada, including a few in Great Britain, um, of all budget sizes. And I'm just thinking, okay, I know this, I gotta ride this wave while it's here and capitalize on this momentum that's happening right now. And I'm just so pumped because it's happening. Yes, I, I think there are, there are some, of course, real differences between a large organization like the New York Philharmonic and an organization the size of the California Symphony. I think those differences in some ways are what people would assume and in some ways not. So I mentioned it's not about the budget. I firmly believe that having worked at organizations, Seattle Symphony and Seattle Opera were both 30 million plus budgets. Uh, the Bumbershoot Music and Arts Festival, I was managing about $8 million there, and then California Symphony is just under $2 million. And at any one of those organizations, the process of budgeting was the same. Um, the financial document is by and large the same. At any orchestra, it costs about the same to play a Beethoven symphony. You don't do it with different amount of players. You don't do it faster. You know, all of that, you know, line item by line item, it's pretty much the same. What's different are a couple things. One you touched on is that at a smaller organization, the advantage is that we can be agile and nimble, as you said, in a way that big institutions simply cannot. Uh, being bigger means there are more layers, there, are, there is more bureaucracy, and I don't mean bureaucracy in the negative sense that that word sometimes takes on. I mean it in the sense of uh, extra process, extra layers are required at a bigger organization of any industry. That's just fact. So that is all true. I think uh, a big difference is also the people. In order to accomplish the mission at a large institution versus a smaller one, it takes substantially more people. Not on stage, that's about the same, the, the number of musicians, but, but administratively way more people because there are so many more performances, um, so many more community engagement activities, just everything is on a higher scale. But I will also say, despite those differences, my opinion is that the industry tends to over-exaggerate some of the differences in budget sizes. So what I mean by that is, of all nonprofits in America, 90% have a budget of a million dollars or less. So already by B, and in the orchestra world, 90% are uh, under 2 million. It's just a more costly uh, nonprofit than a non-musical nonprofit. But, um, but so already by having a budget of about $2 million, we're in the top 10% of, or yeah, top 10% of orchestras across the country. That's right. That's right, and we're just under two million, so who know, whatever that would be, top 12% or something, you know. So I think, to me, that's really interesting because I, I think the way our industry tends to overly focus on what, especially for my particular role, it's all about what size budget have you managed? I, and it just becomes all about the number on the page rather than how do you motivate people? How do you cast a vision and get people to buy into that vision? Because that's a skill that scales. Whether it's the big time board members or the staff who's reporting up to you, like, you know, managing up, managing down. Those are skills that I think scale are important skills to build if we're ever going to be successful as leaders in any business. And to me, that's where the difference lies, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's just... Um, there are different, uh, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say there are differences. It's just, I don't, it's, it is nuanced. And I don't mean to say that these big institutions are not difficult or not challenging because that's not true at all. Um, if anything, the challenges maybe are magnified there. But, um, but I don't know. I do think there's maybe an overemphasis on the, on the differences on the number on the page is what I'm trying to say. Yes. I think when casting a vision, trying to create change, lead change, I think I think there are two big I think schools of thought or strategies that I tend to follow and 
and, and bringing people along and creating that change. One strategy is uh, is being so data driven. That has served me well my entire career, no matter what role in the organization I've played, because I've always been the one with the quote unquote crazy idea trying to get buy in from others. In 2008, it was at Seattle Opera trying to make a pitch for starting social media channels. And, you know, and, and I just remember them saying, like, what are we going to do? And we can't control the conversation. And I was saying, that's the entire point is that we don't. And, but then, but then how do you put data behind that to show, and same thing with digital ads. How do, how do I convince people that we need to be putting ad spend there? You know, again, 10 years ago or 11 years ago now. Um, and so no matter what it was, being data driven is really helpful because then it's not me fighting for my subjective opinion. It's me saying, look, the data shows that uh, whether if it was social media, you know, engaging people in this way can be an indicator of future proclivity to buy tickets. Okay, if we can connect those dots, there's a business case for this. Um, similarly, with some of the things that I do now, on, focusing on patron loyalty, for example, starting to measure the, you know, measuring lifetime value of a patron is very difficult with our CRM systems in the arts, but measuring something like the three-year value of a patron or the five-year value of a patron is measurable. It's a lot of work to try to crunch all those numbers, but it is, it's doable. And so be, by being able to say, look, when we don't solicit for a donation too soon, when we don't ask them to get married, when we've only been on one date, right? <laughs> when we, when we, <laughs> oh, thank you. I didn't make that up, but I love it. Um, when we uh, instead focus on metrics that, that do measure loyalty, how do we get a first time attendee to come back within 12 months of their first experience? Because all the research in our field shows if we can do that, that lifetime value of that patron is going to skyrocket. So looking at that and actually running the numbers of making these changes, how do we measure the three-year value or the five-year value of a patron before, sort of the, under the old way of doing things versus this new way where we're disciplined and we're focused, being able to paint that picture with numbers, you can't argue with that. And so that is one way that I've really brought people along. And now, you know, I'm able to say through all of this work, we've doubled the number of tickets we sell in a year. We've doubled our audience. We are having to add performances to accommodate the demand of our growing audience. I mean, these are stats that I don't know of another orchestra in America who can say that. And so again, but it's all so data driven and numbers driven. And that's, I mean, of course, board members respond to that. That's, that's, a, that's a language they speak, you know? So there's that. The other strategy and path is all about the people. And, you know, as Jim Collins would say, you got to get the right people on the bus. And yeah, there, that means that sometimes changes have to be made. And what I've come to learn, especially over the last four or five years, is that the more I am able to clearly articulate a vision and put a stake in the ground on what I believe and what I stand for, in terms of what the organization is doing and and express that the more it becomes so clear who's on board and who's not and sometimes that means there's got to be changes i think that's true for the lifetime of any business and what's also true though is the more clear you are the more you put that stake in the ground the more you attract people to you that also share that vision. And that's the part that's so exciting. I mean, you know, change is hard, especially with people and in sometimes people who've served our organizations for a long time. Yeah, those, those things are hard. But then when you see, oh my gosh, there are so many people who want to work with me and want to execute this vision because they're dying to make some change in the industry. That's amazing. And then you're hiring people who, you know, eat, sleep, breathe this stuff and want to be there so badly. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying education is key in, de in developing audiences. And what I'm also saying is if the school system is not providing it, then we have to somehow as orchestras. That's what I'm saying. And so many orchestras think that we're filling in that gap by providing student education. Almost every orchestra in America has some sort of childhood music education program. 
very few have any kind of adult education, whether that's content online, all the website stuff I mentioned, or we've, this gets into a whole other thing we've done, but we've launched adult education programs like Music 101 type classes and received grant funding uh, to do that. And so that's what I'm saying. I'm saying education is essential. And if schools aren't providing it, then we need to. See, yeah, see, this is where I think orchestras have such an advantage over other performing arts organizations. So for example, opera companies, they have one piece of music on the program every night. It's one opera. So uh, in that sense, I think new music is a much harder sell for an opera company because it's binary. People either want it or not. With orchestras, we have a huge advantage in our programming. And I think there is no shame in pairing something lesser known with something that we know is going to sell. I think there's no shame in that at all. That's how we can bring people in and then, going back to the idea of exposure, exposing people to this other wonderful slice of our art form that is available. So um, I think, but I do think it does take exposure and it does take education. Again, you know, the expression familiarity breeds contempt is not true in classical music. It's just the opposite. Familiarity is what breed sales. <laughs> so um, I think in that sense, it, you know, it's our job and our obligation to the art form. And I think it is our job and obligation to growing audiences. And I kind of, um, I kind of hate when orchestras think they need to program what, uh, what they think audiences want to hear. You know, I, I, <sighs> Yeah, exactly. All this, you know, pop music that's been symf symphonicized or, or and orchestrated and all, you know, all of that. I think I, what I do think is what's so interesting. I don't think that stuff is bad. I think that all of this, though, showcases the incredible spectrum of what an orchestra can do. So I think I think, you know, if we're going to talk about programming, I think what is a disservice is siloed programming. We're only going to do a concert with, you know, the Beatles music. We're only going to do whatever, the Beethoven and some other Mozart warhorse or, you know, something like that. Instead, once we start breaking down those silos, what if we did a program with some Beatles music and a program with some other warhorse? Then it's that's all music and it's all okay. And I think that that has been a lot of my strategy and my approach. And, you know, as executive director, I don't oversee all programming. I work in partnership with the music director on that. But um, whatever orchestra I land at eventually someday again as CEO, I'm going to be looking for that in as, a part, as a quality in my partner and the music director is this, how do we appreciate that entire spectrum of music that's out there and program across that spectrum instead of here's the pops concert, here's the movie concert, here's the traditional concert. We got to break that stuff down because that is not serving our art form. I don't think that's a good idea. I think, yeah, I think it, I think, I think silos of any kind are not a good idea, but I think when we do that, it's almost setting ourselves up for failure because people who identify as advocates or fans or proponents of new music will buy tickets to that concert. And anybody else who has any sort of either unfamiliarity or uh, familiarity and dislike of contemporary music won't come. And I think if our jobs are to be proponents of all of this, all of the music that exists for our orchestras, then programming in that silo is not setting us up for success. So, and it's also not fair to, for somebody to say, I don't like all new music. So if we're programming that way, we're sort of allowing for that statement to be made. You know, when, when a piece of music is not familiar and we may only be hearing it once in our lifetimes because it doesn't get performed again very often, then yeah, as institutions, we have a big responsibility to help prepare people to understand it. I was going to say enjoy it, but maybe understand it is a better word. Our, our obligation is to help prepare people to understand what they're going to be listening to. And I think that takes a lot more work on the part of the institution. And we have to we have to acknowledge that as arts leaders, 
And we have to deliver on that. Otherwise, we're not setting up people to enjoy it or to have a good experience. Yes, I, I get asked this question all the time and I love it because I think that there is such a fear in our industry of what will the core audience think? And that fear is not ungrounded. I think that's a rational question to be asking. So here's the experience that I've had at the California Symphony. On one hand, all of the marketing tactics that we've employed aren't specifically to attract young professionals. They're just marketing tactics that are on current trends. Digital marketing, the way we write our copy, everything else we've talked about, about the education and the language we use, that, that's on the forefront of trends and technology. Therefore, <laughs> consumers on the forefront of trends and technology have responded to it. But also, all, I will get more specific in a moment, but also on a larger scale, all the data shows that older adults are also on social media, online, you know, all of these things. And so we are also reaching those ages as well, even though the perception might be that, you know, you look at our concert hall and you see that the age has gone down and you see younger faces. Like, that's great. We're, we didn't start a young professionals club to do that. We just got current and savvy in the way we market to everybody. So I say that. Also, in terms of going back to the question of specifically how did the core audience respond, by and large, people have been positive because what I'm hearing is, Aubrey, I see that that hall used to be half empty. I've been coming here for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and I see that the hall used to be half empty. And now I see that we're bursting at the seams and that we're adding performances. And I see younger faces when I look around. Thank you. That's usually the response. Um, it is also important to know that people behave, you know, with the rules that you uh, said back or policies that we've implemented, bring your drinks to your seats, have your phones on and silent. Um, people behave, you know, they come to the concert and this is how it usually plays out. They take their selfie when they arrive with the orchestra warming up in the background. Some people take photos during the performance some people take some short videos of the performance and we've had to really work with our union about you know what's okay and what's not okay. Um, but when I see that, I'm, but it's not distracting, I will say. So there's two things. It's not distracting. People know how to behave. Um, and it's not like somebody's like, their phone's like looking like a strobe light because they're on Twitter the whole time or, you know, it's nothing like that. You know, people, they know how to behave. Two, uh, when I see that happening, I, I'm so excited because this is how people consume culture today. You go to any concert of any genre besides classical music, and that's what people do. They want to take the photo. They want to post it online, and then they want to share it with everybody they know. And this now gets it kind of circles, completes the circle back to what's current in marketing trends there's an author, Mark Schaefer, who says, he's a marketing expert, a professor at Rutgers, and he says that now two thirds of marketing is not controlled by the organization. It's controlled by its customers. So when orchestras cut that off and don't let people take photos, videos, I mean, I've been to so many other symphony orchestras, the, you know, and the first thing you hear is, please turn off your cell phones, right? And it's like, yeah, and it's not exactly. And I'm just, and every time I now have a very visceral reaction to that. One, it's not very nice. Two, it just, um, it completely shuts off two thirds of the marketing capability sitting in that room. Why would we, and then, and then these same orchestras say, oh, we're declining in sales, why is that? I think there is a real irrational fear about how the core, quote unquote, core audience will respond. And I, which is why you brought up the question in the first place, presumably like what do these uh, loyal and lucrative patrons think? And I think that that, um, on one hand, that is not a bad question to ask. On the other hand, to be so fearful of change 
means that we will never grow our audience beyond that core group. Like we know what that outcome looks like. That's how it's been the last 20, 30 years at our organizations. We know what that picture looks like and it's not working anymore. But also what data shows is that the loyal patrons, these core people, the subscribers who are buying these big packages uh, and donors, they're in. By the time somebody is a subscriber for three years, their renewal rate is like 90, 95%. I mean, it's, there's, we have to really do something crazy to lose them. They're just, that's, they're so sticky as patrons at that point. And so I think it's this weird um, dichotomy that sometimes organizations feel like they're walking on eggshells around this group, yet yeah, those are the most loyal and sticky patrons. It's the other, you know, 80% of people who are coming as an estimate, you know, that, um, or 50% maybe if uh, usually for an orchestra, it's about 50% single tickets, 50% subscribers. So at least the other half that that's the group that's on eggshells because they are not loyal. And by not changing, we, like I said, we know what that outcome looks like. I love what you just said. I'm not only interested, I'm hopeful speaking to you. That's like one of the best compliments. Th I mean, thank you so much. That's amazing.